Hello, Christ Church family. As you know, we are in a break between seasons of the Our Church, Our Stories podcast. In this time, we wanted to bring you something a little different to hold you over until season two rolls out. Therefore, it is my pleasure to introduce John Guest Remembers, a miniseries of the Our Church, Our Stories podcast put together by another one of our own, John Poister. In this first episode of our miniseries, Pastor John, in his own words, reflects on his early childhood in England as World War II raged on just outside his door. We invite you to join Pastor John as he recalls what it was like for him in those days as John Guest remembers. Well, it's amazing as a child, life comes at you. I mean, this is me looking back at it and trying to interpret uh, what was going on in my psyche, in my life, in my experience during that, in, during those war years. And uh, what's always astounding to me is that as a child, you take life as it comes. You don't have any premonition of what it should be as a child, young child. Life is what it is. So you're learning as you go along and absorbing the circumstances. So the further context of my years of growing up during the war is that my father died when I was seven years of age. I was born in 1936, so that places me right in the middle of the... Uh, the battle for Britain. And my memory of it is uh, pretty vivid. For a start, because of uh, my father's death, my mother being left with three boys, of which I was the oldest, uh, we were sent off to other members of the family to look after us, to give my mother a break. She had a, a, a near baby, a little one. And then there was my brother, Tony, who was 18 months younger than I was. And we were pretty uh, mischievous. It, uh, so it was a lot for my mother to handle with my father's death, a, a baby, and two rambunctious kids. So... In the first place, I was sent uh, by myself to give my mother a break from me to uh, the east end of London from Oxford. Uh, I was born in Oxford. My family, I was raised in Oxford up until I was 16 when we moved to London to live. So at age seven, somewhere in that area, I went to London to live with my Auntie Gwen and Uncle Jack in their uh, tenement apartment in the east end of London, in Hackney, which really took the brunt of the Blitz on London. And my first memory was of us being rushed down to the basement of this tenement building and the uh, and explosions going on outside the building, bombs being dropped. And my hearing, it hurt my ears, the concussion of the, uh, the explosion hurt my ears. And I said, what's that? And they just sort of hushed me down. They didn't say, oh, we're being bombed or we're, you know, we're under attack or this is the only safe place to be. They just sort of hushed it up. They didn't want to deal with telling this little boy who'd just come up from Oxford that he was being bombed and our life was in danger. So that was the first experience. And then growing, then, then the excitement came for a little boy of seeing the anti-aircraft guns set up in the streets outside at major junctions where there was space in the middle of the road to shoot down the planes that were coming in to bomb us. And these anti-aircraft balloons 
great big dirigibles. Uh, it's hard to... Uh, they looked massive to this little boy that were on steel cables. On uh, And the cables would be released from uh, large spools. And so these dirigibles would float up into the sky, which was fascinating for a little lad to watch. And those were there, I mean, you don't hear much conversation, but to stop the planes coming in low and strafing the streets. So they went up high enough to keep the, bom the bombers and the other planes higher, the German planes, because they didn't want to fly in amongst these cables that would chop their wings off. So it kept them high up. And uh, that was all fascinating. Also, after the bombing, to go and play on the bomb sites with the other kids. They became playgrounds for us. Quite an extraordinary thing. I can remember that clearly. Welcome back to John Guest Remembers, an Our Church, Our Stories podcast miniseries. In this episode, Pastor John recounts what it was like living in London under the threat of air raids from the Germans and their buzz bombs. As a consequence of those air raid attacks, the government made available to families, if they wanted to use them, air raid shelters that they would put up in their back garden. And the way that worked was to, they were corrugated steel in a half-moon shape, like a Quonset hut shape. And uh, you would dig a hole maybe about three feet deep so that you go down some. These uh, arched concrete, uh, excuse me, these arched pressed steel corrugated uh, pieces would be fastened there and then dirt put all over the top of it. The dirt that you've dug out from underneath thrown over the top. And uh, we slept there, uh, bunk beds on both sides, tight quarters. So my uncle and auntie slept on uh, bunk beds on one side and Tony and I slept on bunk beds the other side. And as I was the older brother, I slept on the taller bunk bed. But we slept there every night then as protection against bombing. And I think those, uh, they was made to live to survive anything but a direct hit. Well, one Saturday morning, I remember, I was playing out in the back garden when a buzz bomb came over. A V2, as they were called, or buzz bombs as we nicknamed them in London. And they were rocket fueled bombs that were f released, sent off the ground in northern France or Belgium, which were now within German occupation, with enough fuel to get it over London. And when the fuel ran out, they just fell. And so this one came over, and the you know, you've got these legendary little stories that you hear as a, a boy, so that we knew that that buzz bomb... The reason they called it a buzz bomb was the way the jet fuel or the rocket fuel propelled it. So it wasn't a, a constant like that, but it was zoom, zoom, zoom. It came over, so we called them buzz bombs. And when that started, then you'd hear it sputter, and then you know it was going to fall out of the sky. And we knew that it could either glide on for you like another quarter of a mile or so till it hit the ground. It could do a straight down dive and in some cases even circle back because it's without propulsion. So however it fell, however its wings were, because it was on two wings, uh, maybe a, a tail mm. to keep it more or less upright. 
But it was really a flying bomb, is what it was. And so I'm in the back garden and I see one coming over. I hear it first and then I watch it go over right in front of me to about one o'clock in the sky. And then it sputtered and died. And I ran into the house and shouted out that the buzz bomb was coming down and dove on the floor, you know, dramatically. I mean, I was kidding. It's almost like watching a movie. Uh, my aunt actually was out on the street going to do some shopping. When that thing exploded about a quarter of a mile, it hit the ground about a quarter of a mile from where we lived. Again, the, the, the concussion blew in our windows. It lifted my aunt, she said, off her feet and blew her back about, uh, you know, six or seven feet. Just the, the air pressure from the explosion. And the bombs were so devastating, it, 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 it flattened about a half a, half a block of building. Today they've turned it into a memorial park and it's very close to the River Thames where we used to go fishing. Which brings me to another very graphic memory. My Uncle Arthur was really into fishing and the River Thames being within, uh, you know, 15 minutes walk from our house, about that quarter of a mile, uh, was very uh, available. And so he taught us how to fish, how to prepare the bait. And we, were, we became addicted to it. We loved the fishing and the different kinds of bait you could use and the different spots on the river. And there was one spot on the river where you had this empty, blank ground, what would you say, Unco uncultivated land that ran down from a pub to the river. And we're fishing in the river at that point when a German plane comes over. Single plane. So everybody, because there were some other men fishing, but my brother Tony and I were fishing with my Uncle Arthur, ran back up the bunt, uh, back up this bank uh, to the pub where they had turned the outdoor urinal into a makeshift bomb shelter as well. So it's covered with con reinforced concrete. So we're now all in there looking out, watching this plane go by with its uh, German symbol on the side, and you could see the pilot. I mean, it was low enough. I mean, it wasn't low, 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 but you could see. So my brother Tony, he said, Uncle, he said, if we can see him, can he see us? Because we're looking out through the entranceway watching this. And my, my uncle cuffed him around the ear and just said, be quiet. And maybe one more memory was the uh, sleeping in this air raid shelter. I was awakened with what I thought was a buzz bomb. And then the, the buzz bomb stopped. And I sat up, at, you know, and watching my head in this uh, makeshift shelter. I said, there's a bomb falling on us. There's a bomb falling on us. It was my aunt snoring. So she was going like. <laughs> <laughs> and then when she went <laughs> and stopped snoring, I thought we were about to be blown apart. Hello, and welcome back to the Our Church, Our Stories podcast. We are continuing our mini-series, John Guest Remembers, and in this episode, Pastor John talks about his early exposure to Christianity, which is not exactly what we might think. Thank you for listening. We went to Sunday school for enough weeks before Christmas. There was a local parish. England's divided up into parishes. The Church of England is the Church of England. And the whole of the landscape is divided up into parishes, geographic areas, with a, a church, a parish church in every one of them, and a minister in that church. 
So I knew Father Y was the uh, Anglican priest in our parish. And I used to see him riding around on his bicycle in the parish with a long black cassock. He drives his bicycle and always had that on. He was the priest of this parish church. And it was an ancient church that went way back to the site to Saxon times. This was just outside Oxford in a borough called Cowley. In fact, there's an order of priests there called the Cowley Fathers that some people knew about. I didn't, but I discovered them since. And we, my Tony brother Tony and I, were sent off to Sunday school for enough weeks that it would take, say, starting the end of November into December, so that come Christmas, we could go to the Sunday school Christmas party for the children. Because we didn't have a whole lot, and my mother was concerned that we get into a Christmas party <laughs> where with cake and jello and stuff like that. Nothing fancy, but was fancy for us in those days. And we as children were invited to a factory Christmas party. But the only time we went to Sunday school, we never went to church, regular church, but Sunday afternoon Sunday school, was in order to get into a Christmas party. There were two, the, two sources of Christian influence for us, primarily. One was in school, we had school assemblies where we sang hymns and they had prayers and read some part of the Bible. I don't know if they read the Bible in the assembly, but we certainly sang hymns and had prayers and then school announcements. We had Christian or Bible education, it would have been essentially Christian in England in those days, in the classroom. So I wasn't completely irreligious because we learned the Ten Commandments, we learned the Lord's Prayer, and we learned some of the great traditional hymns in the assemblies, like Holy, 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 and Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven, and All Things Bright and Beautiful, All Creatures Great and Small. Uh, and then there was, in going into the church, that was a, a completely do beautiful and different environment because you had these ancient stained glass windows with Bible stories. You had some Bible teaching. In the Sunday school classes, you were divided up. So those were our two primary sources of uh, Christian information, Bible information. But we never went to church as a family. We never prayed together, ever. Not grace, not bedside, not when we were sick. Uh never prayed, when we didn't have a Bible in the home. So as a family, we were not religious. But when you grow up, at least in those days when you grew up in England, you thought of yourself as being, you know, you got your parish, the Sunday school if you wanted to go there, church if you wanted to go there, um, some kind of worship in the school system. You would have the impression of being Christian, that we were a Christian country. Hello and welcome back to John Guest Remembers, a mini-series of the Our Church, Our Stories podcast. In this week's episode, Pastor John reflects on questions he asked himself as a young teenager, questions that led him to realize that there is a God. I'm walking home from school one day. This is powerful for me. Two things happened in that period of time when I was about 14 years of age. I'm walking home from a school called Temple Cowley School. And uh, as I'm walking home by myself, I'm thinking to myself, why well, it's strange that I would ask this series of questions. I said, like, John, why are you going to school? So I told myself to get a good education. So my next question to myself was this, well, why do you want a good education? Well, so that you can get a good job, earn good money. And so my next question was, well, why do you want a good job and good money? I mean, it's, it's sort of obvious, so that you can live comfortably and have some pleasure, a measure of security. 
And then I said, and then what? And the kind of silence in this interview was like a pause in my mind. And it leapt from that series of questions that all came in split seconds. It takes me a time to say it. But in your mind, that's split seconds. I drew the conclusion there must be a God. My leap was there must be a God. Because to have even asked the question about what is what I'm really asking is what's the meaning of life? Where does this all head? What's the purpose of it all? Surely it's not just to earn enough money to live in order to have some pleasure and security and then die. And bear in mind, I'd already lost my dad, so death was not a fantasy. Also, another kid had gotten killed, died in a, a freak accident camping, and his funeral came right by my house. And in, uh, again, the old days, and though, yes, that would be the old days, all the mourners walked behind the hearse to the graveyard and came by my house. That funeral procession came by my house with the little coffin in the back of the hearse of a kid who was about my age. So uh, that thought of where, where is this all headed? And then one other thing, which I've never forgotten, and it paved the way. We were poorish, so very poor, really. So I was doing whatever I could to help the family. And I got a job at the butcher's shop on a Friday evening cleaning up. And on Saturday morning, working in the butcher's shop. It's just a half-day shopping on Saturday. And then cleaning up afterwards. So they taught me how to butcher meat. Uh, very nothing radical, but I was using some sharp tools, and I had to clean up. I was their boy to clean up, move this, do that, and uh, Mr. Plasto was his name. Was the manager of this butcher shop. He wasn't the owner, but the manager. And so I worked there Friday evening and Saturday morning. Well, Friday, they announced at the school. They uh, advertised that uh, they're going to have practice for getting on the school cricket team. Well, I should have gone right from school to the butcher shop for that last hour or so to help them clean up. And I didn't want to tell them, Mr. Plasto, that I wasn't going to be there or I was going to be late. Really, what it amounted to was I wasn't going to be there that Friday because I wanted to try out for the school cricket team. So I arrive on Saturday morning, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed as if nothing had happened, but Mr. Plasto took me to one side. He said, where were you yesterday evening? I said, oh, I meant to tell you, which was a lie, that I uh, was trying out for the school cricket team and wouldn't be in. But I said, it was my intention to tell you to which Mr. Plasto said, John, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. And that stuck in my mind, because along the way you pick up that there really is a hell when you die, and that was one place, there's, that was a possible place to end up. And it's sure as hell that I knew about that place, I didn't want to be there. So if the path to hell is paved with good intentions, what does that say? I realize that my intention to fly straight, you know, to rev re revise the way I was living, and the good intention of one day being a good boy could really be another paving stone to hell. If Mr. Plasto had no idea what he was, I mean, he knew what he was saying, but he wasn't a religious man that I know of. But that was a piece of... I guess, common wisdom. Welcome back to John Guest Remembers, an Our Church, Our Stories podcast miniseries. In this episode, Pastor John talks about his first encounter with a Christian mentor when he was about 16 years old. I think I was around 16 years of age and working with an electrician as a boy to help him. And his name was Ray Wilson. And the other guys who worked for this company, business, 
swore like troopers. I mean, every other sentence was a swear word, no matter what. It was just a habit. And I fell into that habit at age 16 when I was with the guys of swearing. And it became such a habit that I remember once or twice swearing using the F word in front of my mother. It just fell out of my lips. You know, I'd become an habitual swearer like the guys. And my mother, I remember saying, what did you say? Because she couldn't believe what she heard. And I'd say a word that sounded like it. And she said, that's not what you said. And then, you know, smart guesty said, well, what did you think I said? Well, she wasn't going to say the word she heard. But anyway, I was swearing around Ray Wilson the first day I was working with him, first time I worked with him. And Ray said, John, I just assume you don't swear when you work with me. He was in his middle twenties, I would guess. Young guy. So I said, why not? He said, because I'm a Christian. Well, I mean, you just think out of the blue, he said, I'm a Christian. I said, well, so am I. So he said, why would you think you're a Christian? I said, because I believe in God in that vague sense, having determined there must be a God. And I'm English, because England's a Christian country. I didn't give the explanation I just said, well, I believe in God, and I'm English. His response was, well, there are Jews who believe in God who wouldn't thank you to call them Christian. That made sense. So I said, well, what makes you a Christian? He said, well, just take the word Christian. A Christian is a Christian. His life revolves around Christ, like a soccer player's life revolves around soccer. He used the word football, which is what we call it. A footballer's life revo revolves around football. Well, that was my number. So that made sense. So right there and then, I knew I wasn't a Christian. And I know that you found out in simple terms that a Christian was a Christian whose life revolved around Christ. So then I asked the next obvious question from like a standing start, very naive. I wasn't being smart-mouthed, not at that point. I said, well, why Christ? To which he said, when Jesus came, he said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And he was quoting from John's Gospel, chapter 10 and verse 10, but he didn't give me chapter and verse. I just found that out later. But all that's when God, in a sense, moved in me, like that conversation I had with myself maybe a year or so earlier, a couple of years earlier. It was like I thought, well, that's what I'm looking for. I didn't say that out loud. But that idea of an abundant life was exactly what I, as a young teenager, was looking for. Then we talked about Jesus. Why Jesus? And he spoke about his not just coming to, when he said to, that he came that we might have life and have it like in all its fullness, joyful, exciting, abundant was the word. That was a revelation. Hello, and welcome back to John Guest Remembers, a mini series of the Our Church, Our Stories podcast. At this point in his story, Pastor John has become a regular churchgoer and makes his commitment to Christ at a Billy Graham crusade in London. Well, in going to uh, St. Mary's Church in Walthamstow, uh, which is an eastern suburb of London, I went there chasing Shirley White. But the preacher was just very masculine, made sense, and he was preaching the same message that uh, I had gathered from Ray Wilson. So it was Jesus-centered, it was preaching the Word, the Bible, and I'd never heard anything quite like it. I'd never heard a preacher. So it wasn't just a teacher, it wasn't just verbal communication of information. Uh, he was, in the way he preached, which was very English, but very strong and masculine, he clearly was reaching in a way that an evangelist does. And that was his heart, to draw people to Christ. 
So in listening to him, I went more and more frequently to hear him. And it was about that time that Billy Graham came to London. And I was a, sort of not... I was a kind of a young man about town, very enthralled with London, uh, was in and out of uh, the downtown, the city area. What they call the city is the banking part of London, the eastern part of London. The West End, as it's called, is more your cultural and historic, you know, Buckingham Palace, Westminster Abbey, Houses of Parliament, Trafalgar Square. And uh, that was all really just like a brief train ride away from Walthamstow. I went dancing about twice a week, once to a club to learn to dance, and then Saturday nights to a, you know, a band. I was into sports very heavily in London, ended up playing for a team. I'd have been about 20 by that age, by the age of 20, playing for a team that were, we got to an All-England final. At the, we lost it, but at the level at which we pray, played, which was a couple of levels down from uh, the pros. It's an amateur club. I was very invested in my social life. And in going to hear Billy Graham, two things were apparent for me, looking back. One is, without knowing the inside story on the religious scene, I knew that Billy Graham had come to London. And the advertising blast across London was absolutely spectacular. It's, uh, it could be in the annals of history in advertising in England, certainly in London. But everywhere you went publicly, so that's on public transportation, which is what you mostly use, whether it's the underground, the tube system, or buses, or billboards, which you saw. It was clear that Billy Graham, and it was a stylized presentation of his face, and his name, the way they wrote his name, Billy Graham, which I can still see in my mind's eye. So I was aware, and I was aware that it was religious. And Haringey Arena was uh, just a couple of boroughs away, maybe in some parts adjacent, to where I lived, Tottenham, home of the Tottenham Hotspurs. But there was a, a sports arena there called the Haringey Arena, and that's where the meetings were secular site sports arena and uh, in fact I'd actually gone there to see roller derby uh, back in those days which is American and amazing to behold they build a rink within the arena a roller rink in any case uh, my vicar Kenneth Druitt Canon Druitt asked me one Sunday as I was leaving church would I go with them that week to hear Billy Graham a simple invitation at the door of the church as I'm walking out. I said, yes, I would go. And all the advertising just made me aware. I had no intention. It didn't even seem to me to be a thing I, I would go and see. It's strange. I was very aware, but had no intention of going. Never thought of it, never crossed my mind. So with that invitation, I actually missed the bus on which they were traveling on the Monday from Walthamstow. They rented a what we would call a coach, a motor coach, to take a whole crowd of people into the uh, Haringey. And I missed that bus, not by much, but I missed it. And so having said I'd go, I made arrangements to go the very next day, the Tuesday, and went with a friend of mine who lived in Tottenham, which is right next door to Haringey. And so the two of us went, Richard Martin and myself, to hear Billy Graham. And so, you know, we caught public transportation and uh, walked up to the big entrance to the arena and sat ourselves down at the back on the floor level. And so it all happened, and it had a massive choir of, I don't know, a thousand voices, shall we say? And there's a certain attractiveness in the British culture to a large choir. So that was attractive. I mean, it's nothing like church. The music was uh, exhilarating. And then Billy Graham spoke. And he was, from an English vantage point, very American. He was aggressive and uh, seemed to be loud. 
and very direct, and he preached from, you know, the opening of his mouth till the call, the altar call at the end. And everything he was saying matched up with what the preacher had been preaching and which Ray Wilson had been witnessing to, the elemental gospel, God loving us enough to send his son Jesus to die for us, and that in dying for us he paid for our sins and in rising from the dead was alive again and spiritually alive that you could invite him, that Jesus, to come into your life. I knew that from Ray Wilson. I heard it preached from uh, Kenneth Druitt, uh, my vicar, and then I heard Billy Graham really preach it, like no preaching I'd ever heard. And when he made the call, and this is uh, a moment I'll not forget, I couldn't believe that he really meant it to ask people to stand up and make a, from an English point of view, a public exhibition of themselves by walking to the front of this very large 10 to 15,000 people meeting. And I thought, he's, he can't mean that. Nobody's going to move. Uh, and it's probably kind of like Yankee hard sell, and he'll back off and give us some other way of expressing a commitment that is less demanding. But he didn't. And he said, the choir's going to sing, and uh, we're going to invite you to come. And the second verse of the hymn, which was their trademark, Just As I Am, Without One Plea, But that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. And so the second verse of that, I was sitting there with Rich Martin. I said, I don't know about you, Rich, but I'm going to go forward. And he said, I'll go with you. And so the two of us went forward, and I don't know what it really meant for him long term, but for me it was radical to the very root and core of uh, my personal life, because that evening I really did hand over my life to Jesus. He, we were siphoned off at the close of that altar call, as I learned to name it afterward, and met with a man who put some literature into my hand, found out a little bit about me, name, address, no, not my address, but the church I went to, and that information was passed on to the church. So they had a system, so the church could then come after me. Uh, but I was already going to church, but that alerted the staff, and there were four or five ordained clergy on the staff, it was a large, vibrant church, that I had made this commitment to Christ, and so they came after me, and I remember my vicar giving me a Bible, a leather-bound Bible. I remember making my way home to Walthamstow from Haringey, public transportation, but, you know, the streets you walk to get to the transport. At one point I was on my own, Richard had gone his way to get to Tottenham, and I was on my way to Walthamstow, and I was... Uh, I think literally swinging around lampposts on shop lines that came out over storefronts, kind of singing in the rain kind of experience. Went home and told my mother, who was in bed, actually sitting up in bed knitting. And I went upstairs to bed and I said to mum, I've become a Christian. And I thought she'd be fairly excited about that, whatever that would mean, because we were not a religious family. But clearly it meant I'd sort of taken the Christian faith seriously. And I don't know what else I told her at that moment, but she was not that receptive. She kind of cold-shouldered it. Oh, that's nice, my son, kind of response. Polite, but not excited, not engaging. I later took my mother to one of the meetings. And I remember saying to her at that time, as she heard Billy Graham and the altar call came along, I said, do you want to go forward, Mum? And she said, not tonight, son, which was, again, a polite no. And it was only for some years later af after that that uh, she became a, a, a believer, a real believer in Jesus. So that was the beginning of the rest of my life. Welcome back to John Guest Remembers. As we have stated, this is a mini-series of the Our Church, Our Stories podcast. That podcast is an effort by two of our dedicated members, Ben Follett and Sam Dabrotka, to share some of the stories of you, the Christchurch family, with the rest of the Christchurch family. You can find Season 1 of the Our Church, Our Stories podcast on our website, ccgf.org podcast, or from wherever you download your podcasts. 
Be sure to check out the stories from Season 1 and be on the lookout for Season 2. On this week's episode of John Guest Remembers, Pastor John recounts his realization that with God he is never alone and how he got involved in the church life of his local parish. I began to uh, read the Bible. I spoke to them, you know, my st- the staff at the church began to give me some direction. And then I listened about, you know, the steps I took in my mind that were moved me into the core of the life of the church as against just being an attender, sitting in a pew for a church service. I moved into the living action of the church life was on Wednesday nights they had a Bible study and prayer meeting. And again, I don't know that I received a personal invitation to that, but one Wednesday night I went. And that was a different experience. Uh, The vicar taught the Bible, and that was more teaching than preaching. I mean, there was a distinction there. And then they had a prayer time where the people prayed out loud, extemporaneously. And that was a brand new experience for me. But I caught on to the idea that you could ease, you can talk to God out loud. I'd already begun to talk with him as if he were walking down the street with me. I'll come back to that. But my first engagement beyond going to church was to go to that prayer meeting. And I remember a couple of weeks in, I gave it a shot at speaking out loud myself to God. And, of course, that got the vicar very excited. And I didn't realize how significant all that was. It was just in pace with what the Christians seemed to do. To back up, the experience of waking up the very next morning, and I was going to a polytechnic college, Southwest Essex Technical College is what it was called, it was part of the Greater London University. And uh, I remember walking down the street, because that college was in the Walthamstow area, so very convenient. I thought, I'm not alone. The Lord is with me. I am not alone. That was a radical feeling. In fact, I remember waking up in bed that morning and my habit, which seems unthinkable nowadays for anybody at any time, but I would sit up in bed and have my first cigarette of the day in bed. I don't know how my mother put up with that. She didn't smoke. But smoking was much more acceptable as in the public in those days. But in any case, that when I, and I, as I sat up in bed, I thought, I'm not alone. The Lord's here with me. I'm his. Or I had this relationship. I wouldn't have said I'm his, but it was a kindred spirit that I had with the Lord. And so walking down the street, I remember that very day, the same sensation. Going back to the steps by which I got involved, and I will come back to that experience of the Lord being with me in my day-to-day living. But the next thing that happened was they were advertising the need for Sunday school teachers. And Sunday school for children in those days was in the afternoon, Sunday afternoon. And so, without knowing anything, I volunteered. And I thought, you know, because I was cool, I could could, could handle a bunch of kids. So they gave me a class of, I don't know, about eight or ten little boys. But the teaching for the class, it's this great disciple um, imaging, The teaching for the class to the teachers was on a Thursday night. And one of the young assistants at the church ran the Sunday school. And he gathered us teachers every Thursday evening in his apartment and taught us the lesson that we were to teach. So now I'm only teaching what is brand new information to me. But it all made sense. It all, that conversion experience and the kind of framework in which it came with the theology of salvation from Ray Wilson and then the structure that that was given now in the class 
and in the preaching and the worship of the church, the hymns we sang. So hymns that I knew from school experiences, you know, having assemblies, began to make sense. They fitted within a theological framework. And that all came very easily to me, being an engineer, or training to be an engineer, because everything is formulary. Uh, it all makes sense. Engineering makes sense. Math makes sense. Physics makes sense. The elements, you know, metallurgy, how elements are mixed to make stainless steel, and uh, or the difference between cast iron and regular steel, and how they're machined, and, and uh, you know, all those elements make sense. And that was my style, my intellectual style. I was looking to make sense. So I didn't have a liberal arts mindset, kind of airy-fairy, make it up as you go along. It all had to fit. So the commandments fitted with the need for salvation because you broke the commandments. Jesus becoming a sacrificial offering to pay for the sins made sense. So the teaching fitted into that framework because that's what the church was about, that church. It was an Anglican church, Church of England, and was a very ancient establishment church. In fact, uh, it was the parish, the area that Clement Attlee, Member of Parliament, who became the Prime Minister, replacing Winston Churchill, that was his area. So once a year he would turn up in church for some kind of formal ceremony of, that was related to the government and his leadership in the nation. That was my church, St. Mary's Walthamstow. So it was an establishment, ancient church. It actually, on that site, went back to Saxon times. It's a very, very ancient site. So it had an ancient graveyard around it as well. Hello and welcome back to John Guest Remembers, a mini-series of the Our Church, Our Stories podcast. This week, Pastor John, now teaching Sunday school at his church, experiences the power of the word in bringing a person to Christ. So now I'm teaching Sunday school. And one of the Sundays I remember going to visit, because one of the lads had, who'd been attending ceased to you know, come, we had his address and his family name. His family didn't come to church, but they sent him or took him. And uh, I went to their house and knocked on the door and inquired after him because he had stopped coming. And I was just a teenage lad, like a young man. I was a young man. But I was amazed with which the respect and the credibility I was greeted. And they were impressed that I'd come looking for their son. I mean, that's a real lesson there. I mean, I could pass that lesson on to teaching seminarians or Sunday school teachers here, the power of that invitation of going after one person. Because that's what the gospel is too, the one sheep that got lost out of a hundred. Well, the next thing that happened in the summers, the, uh, the, the y younger staff in the church organized a camp, a week away camp, with part of the church, National Church, an organization called Pathfinders, with uh, young teenage boys. So they were looking for counselors. That's not what they called us at that time, but volunteers to go and work at the camp. And what they did in those days, remarkable, because you had all these private schools all over England, some of them famous, some of them not so famous, but they were boarding schools. And in the summers, the property became available. So we, we Pathfinders, rented the property, a school. So you had dormitories, you had dining, you had sports facilities. And so three summers that I can remember in a row, I uh, volunteered to go take two weeks of my summer and uh, go to these camps. So I was then given a dormitory of uh, boys, 
could be a dozen, fifteen lads sleeping in a dormitory as my responsibility along with another young adult like myself. And uh, we had morning meetings and uh, an evening meeting, a morning meeting. We had a meeting with the dormitory, small group. We had a morning session with the whole camp. Afternoon was all sports and athletics. And then there was an evening meeting. The evening was pretty serious stuff. The morning was, and it was more, t that was the difference. Morning was teaching, evening was preaching. And I was asked to teach one morning at one of those camps. I was honoured to do so. And I still can remember to this day what it was I taught on. And it was about the influence of friendships and the need to hang out with the right kind of people, you know, godly or Christianly focused people, righteous people. Because when you hang out with the wrong crowd, you end up doing the wrong stuff. That was the subject matter. And there is a Bible verse that teaches that, uh, you know, the quality of your company you keep helps determine the quality of your own life. So th that had me public speaking to the whole camp on that issue. That could have been anywhere from 70 to 100, 120 lads or boys. So that, w but that was a major engagement to give up two weeks of my summer to be with a crowd of boys and again being discipled by other leadership you're learning around the edges of that it's a form of discipleship training teaching experiencing christian leadership responsibility yourself welcome back to john guest remembers a ccgf podcast and mini series of the our church our stories podcast in this episode, Pastor John becomes involved in his parish's hospital ministry, which leads to him delivering his first sermon. My vicar was the chaplain at the local hospital. And that was a responsibility he took seriously. On a Sunday afternoon at four o'clock, this is kind of indelibly imprinted, you know, I can give you four o'clock in the afternoon, young adults like myself go to that hospital and he had, like, as I say, these four or five ministry assistants himself and, say, three others. So that would be four different hospital wards that we would divide up on into and go and have a half an hour worship service for the patients. And that was the old-fashioned hospital ward. I guess you only ever see them in movies in the USA anymore where there'd be about a dozen or 20 people around the edge of the room and you pulled curtains around whenever they were going to be doing something personal to your body. So that was an open, large open area with 15, 20 people. And we had a church service, half an hour. And we would, us supporters, we would give out little hymnals at the beds. So there'd be three hymns sung. One at the beginning, one in the middle, one at the end. Somebody would announce the hymns. There was a piano on the ward. Each ward had a piano. Isn't that interesting? You took it for granted in those days. And uh, so somebody would play the piano, part of the group that went in. Uh, we'd sing the hymn. There'd be a prayer, a scripture reading, another hymn, sermonette, and another hymn, and that all took a half an hour. You know, you're about three minutes per hymn, and a little brief uh, extemporaneous prayer, reading of scripture, and the 10 minute sermon, sermonette, homily. So I would go, and one time they asked me, would I read the scripture? And I was as nervous as could be reading out loud. And then they asked me, would I lead the prayer? There was divide, you know, it's a, you can see what was going on here with these young adults. And I was nervous about that, but I just talked to God like I talk, like I'm talking to you. At least I gave it a shot just to talk to him. It was just ordinary language and praying for the people in bed, their illnesses, their family, you know, simple prayer for God's work in their lives, healing. And didn't, it wasn't a very complicated prayer. It was like a minute or two. And uh, so I prayed that prayer. Again, very nervously. 
I don't know if my voice quivered, my lips quivered, but I was nervous doing something like that in public. And then, I don't know, a year in, 18 months into that, because I did that from about age 18, later 18, through till 21. So about three years. About, uh, I don't know, about a year into doing that Sunday by Sunday. So now you get a picture of my Sunday. I, I began going to church Sunday morning as well as Sunday evening. Taught Sunday school at two o'clock. Stayed around, because that went from two to three. Hung around, and then from four until five, or four, four thirty, uh, went with these other young adults. And there were one or two girls in that mix that I was interested in. That wasn't the reason I was doing it, but they turned up and uh, made life a whole lot more welcoming. So one Sunday, they are going into that Sunday, one of the young minister's assistants wasn't going to be able to be there. So they said, will you give the little sermon? And so I, and I can still remember what I preached on that first sermon. I said, yes. I always went to the, I either, I went to the movies mostly or dancing Saturday night. So that made getting to church, or that was 11 o'clock, a challenge, because I'd be out till late. So it's either a movie, late Saturday, or dancing. But when I got home that Saturday night before I was preaching, family had all gone to bed, and I, had, I was living with three brothers and my mother and uh, my, father, my stepfather. Um, I preached to myself in front of the mirror over the fireplace. So it's just like a fireplace, so there's a mirror there. And I stood about where you're sitting and preached to the mirror. So I could see what it looked like. And I'd only ever heard two preachers in my life. Billy Graham and my vicar. Mm -hmm. And I obviously couldn't, wasn't even pretending to be American. But the aggressive style, the truth driven home to reach somebody like to get them by the it, I mean relationally it's like getting a hold of them by the scruff of the neck and saying listen to this this is really important you need this and even as I'm saying that to you you can get the feel of what preaching is and that's how I preached a combination of Billy Graham and my vicar and in uh, five to ten minutes, I preached the gospel. I just preached from the text in one of the Psalms, drinking the cup of salvation. And there are two things about that. There is a cup of salvation, and you've got to drink it. I mean, that would be a great two-point sermon. What the salvation is, and you need to respond to it. Anyway, walking out, I mean, and I unloaded it. I mean, I preached it, I, and I can still remember the feeling of doing it. You know, God took over. It was a blessed moment. Walking back, the young group, the, the young adults with me, because now, so we make our way to the elevator to all, you know, we're done. And uh, one of the young adults said, John, you were just like Billy Graham. Hello and welcome back to John Guest Remembers, a mini-series of the Our Church, Our Stories podcast. In this week's episode, Pastor John talks about the personal nature of his relationship with Christ and the history and process of how he began to see his future in the ministry. A number of things instinctively, I knew that night, within 24 hours of giving my life over to Jesus, I'm making a public profession of faith, which I realize is very, very important, declaring your hand, especially with a friend who was another trainee in this engineering program. To give, give, give a larger context, just to the, of not being alone, that, I, that Jesus was with me, because I grasped that. So as I'm going home that night, Jesus is with me. I am not alone. But waking up the next morning... My fresh new thought was, I'm not alone. 
and then going down the street. Woodland Road, Walthamstow. I'm not alone. So when I sat in a class, when I was on a soccer field, when I was uh, at the company where I was working, I was not alone. And I began to talk to the Lord about what I was learning, experimenting with, with the engineering and the manufacturing and uh, the classwork and, and so on. I uh, began to talk to him about, uh, you know, the girls that you would date. It became an ongoing running kind of conversation. Uh, not alone. Now, the larger context is this. I was feeling very alone because we had moved from Oxford. I guess there was a kind of a loneliness even in Oxford growing up. I always had a strong sense of my own identity, my own inner man, my own inner being. So it was on, you know, I'm going back to reflecting on where does all this head? Why am I going to school? What's, what's the point of it all? And those were private thoughts. I don't remember ever discussing that with anybody. But I never had any real friends that I could really closely trust. Uh, there was always a, a space, sometimes quite an adequate, you know, a major space between myself and people that I thought were real friends, were uh, school-wise friends. I suppose I would never have ever measured up as a friend, but none of my friends ever measured up as a friend to me either. And here and there, I felt some letdowns. Now, when we moved from Oxford to London, now we're in a big, major metropolitan area where I knew no one. So I'm making all my friendships and associations from a standing start. And that was very lonely. So, for instance, I can remember our first Christmas, maybe second Christmas and third Christmas and whatever, followed until I became a believer in Jesus. London was gay, bright, shining lights, fantastic storefronts, and, you know, carols and music and the anticipation of gifts and parties and, and Christmas. And yet I would walk around in that, up and down the street near where I live, the shopping street, very alone, lonely, and looking at all the gaiety, the the joy, the f bright lights, what London represented, whether it's the sports or the movies or whatever else was there, um, very alone. So you go to bed, you're alone. Uh, you walk down the street, you're on your own. So in getting to know Jesus transformed that sense of, self-awareness that was not alone. That was the end of any loneliness for me. Because I had this intimate personal relationship with the living God who would never let me down, would never take advantage of me, was not a user, uh, understood me perfectly and loved me perfectly, and who I responded to I can't say I loved him perfectly, but with a wholehearted trust. So that relationship was the beauty of the ongoing beauty of what Christian faith is, salvation. It meant that my life now had a sense of destiny because I had a personal relationship with God and he was on my, I was on his team. I was going to say he was on my team, but he was definitely for me. Now I knew what the big picture was. I knew that heaven was my home. So I had a destination that was settled. I knew heaven was my home no matter when I died from that moment on. So if I died in an accident or through an illness, heaven was my home. Not because I was good enough, but because Jesus had given me eternal life. And I didn't even know that phrase to use it, but I knew what that meant, that I had an eternal relationship with God, I mean forever, that led to glory in heaven. Well, when you've got a destination, this isn't just clever words, 
you can have a sense of destiny so that between here and arriving in heaven, my life was going to count for something, which was always a question mark. What are you going to do with your life? Is it really just a matter of as much pleasure as you can get as quickly as you can? Or is there something significant about it? Will it count for anything? Will you leave a mark that isn't just a faint memory of whoever you were, but you'd make a difference? And I knew that night, instinctively, my life would count for something. And that's all related to Jesus knowing Christ personally, being forgiven by him, being made new and clean by him, being indwelt by him. All this relates to a sense of destiny. Here I am now experiencing this relationship and a sense of destiny about my life and knowing that engineering was not going to be that destiny. That already, that that paled. I mean, to, to be... And I ended up wanting really, in effect, to be working with people rather than raw metals. And while there's some people business in the industry... Uh, your your craft is the what you produce, and uh, that looked meaningless at that point, other than to make a living. So the idea of influencing people the way my vicar had influenced me, and so they began to use me Sunday by Sunday for that service in the hospital. So now I'm giving these five to ten minute homilies. And God was using them. So one Sunday, walking back to the church from the hospital, it was only a couple of blocks away, I was walking with my vicar, Kenneth Druitt. And I said, no, he, we called him Vic. That was our familiarity to call him Vic. I said to him, how do you become one of these, and I went like this for his collar, which he always wore. And the first time I asked him, he really didn't take me, you know, I didn't really get an answer that felt like an answer. So I would think maybe a month later, I asked him the same question I had. He was very accessible. How do you become, I wouldn't have said minister, I would have probably said, how do you become a vicar? So then he took me seriously because I'd come back at him. So it wasn't a light. He knew I'd been thinking about it. It's almost the way he tested me. And so we that got me into the process. But it was that he then put me through a process, which meant going up to Westminster Abbey. And the back of the Abbey, which the general public doesn't see because they just go into this magnificent building, is a huge quadrangle, at least a hundred, two hundred yards square, with all these buildings around it, which are the offices of the Church of England. And he was quite a player in the Church of England. He was a canon in our diocese, which is an honour. And he uh, took me up there, drove me up, and uh, introduced me to the person who was responsible for the whole program by which young men, it was only in those days, became clergy. And that led to a weekend conference at Farnham Castle, just outside London, a property that the church owned and had as a conference centre. And I don't know if there were a dozen or 15 or 20 young men like myself met and had a two to three day sort of interview process, public large group conversations and small group conversations and one-on-one -on -one conversations. One of the men headed up the uh, one of the seminaries not too far from us, where I lived, in other words, eastern suburb of London. Another was the Dean of Windsor, which was big time, Another was a fellow at Oxford University. So these were serious Christian men who were, 
and there were one or two others, but those three I remember, and they were part of the interviewing group. And they would meet afterwards and determine whether they thought we were you know, ministerial material. And I had a clue that I might well be one because walking out of the castle through these, there was a door within the big gate, walking out, the Dean of Windsor shook hands with each of us as we left. But he said, God bless you, guest. God bless you. I remember one of the questions was he, I don't know if he asked me in a small group or personally. So he said, well, what would you do if people don't want to come to church? I said, well, you go knocking on the doors and visit them, was my answer, simple answer. You go to where they are. I had done a little of that in my own church. And I know he was impressed because that's the obvious answer. You've got to go let them know you're there. So that was it. Welcome back to John Guest Remembers, a CCJF podcast and mini-series of the Our Church, Our Stories podcast. This week, Pastor John Guest recounts his entry into seminary, which coincided with the number of major changes in his family life. I had an option as to which theological college I would go to. I wanted to go to one that was biblical um, and evangelical. We got a variety of uh, churchmanship within Episcopalianism or Anglicanism. Some of it is virtually Catholic in style with uh, chanting. We even had some churches that had Latin services. And when Rome got rid of Latin, they were as disappointed as many Roman Catholics were that there was no more Latin but they would do the chants and then the ceremonial garb, cassocks and albs and bishops with mitres and, you know, very ornate and uh, incense and the ringing of bells, as you're just saying, the communion service. That's one, that's very high church. And then you had middle church liberal, which would have been like more like the liberals of today uh, very critical of scripture. And then you had the more foundational, closer to what in America you would call fundamentalist. Uh, not culturally fundamentalist, but biblically fundamental. In fact, the word comes from the fundamentals, um, five, I think, five or six fundamentals that came out of Princeton uh, Theological College here, seminary, uh, by as they called them in those days, fundamentalists, but that wasn't culturally. The, the, once it, the cultural is no smoking, no dancing, no drinking, no gambling, no movies, etc. Very conservative culturally. That's, that's not been a big part of England. But taking the Bible seriously as the foundational document so that you've got... Uh, Within the 39 articles, which are the theological statement of the Church of England, uh, Article 6 is on the sufficiency of Scripture. And then there was a collect, a prayer from the second Sunday in Advent. Almighty God, who has caused all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest it, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life in our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's, uh, so that represented the article which had the Old Testament scriptures and the New Testament scriptures uh, listed. And when you uh, were ordained, you had to sign a document, and it's still the same today in the Episcopal Church, that you believed them to be the Word of God and that outside those scriptures, nothing was to be believed or held to as necessary for salvation. And so those were big scriptures for us. And then there's one on justification by faith. Again, that was one of the fundamentals through faith alone. So, uh, you know, you've got the scripture, uh, faith, and uh, the atoning work of Christ, substitutionary atonement. That's all spelled out in the Articles of Faith. 
And we at Christ Church have t- adopted those 39 articles because of our Anglican heritage as our f- theological foundation. So I went to a college that held to that. And that was, in those days, it was called Clifton Theological College in Bristol, England. That's the one I chose to go to. So I chose Clifton, Bristol, and was uh, three years of theology, and the Diocese of Chelmsford paid for all that education. And I worked in my vacations in order to earn money for the extras, whether it was my the books I needed to buy or just to live, you know, some living expenses. But uh, all four years of education were residential, so that was all taken care of. Uh, across those years, those were turbulent years in my family, interestingly. I mean, I've, it's hard for me to remember it all at this stage because there are questions in my own mind still about the timing of certain things. But during those years, my mother divorced my stepfather. They separated. My mother sold up the home in London, which we had been buying. We had moved up incrementally with uh, were able to buy a home in London, which would never be possible today, but uh, was possible then. And she moved to Australia uh, with two of my brothers. No, my brother and a sister had been born during those years as well. When I was 21, 20, 21, my mother had another child. But those were very turbulent, difficult years as a family. My mother was not at my ordination from seminary, theological college. She wasn't at my ordination. She was in Australia. I did have an uncle and an aunt who came to my ordination. I have a number of very good photographs taken by a friend and uh, his wife who came to my ordination and some other friends came to it because that's a big deal, becoming the Reverend John Guest. I was ordained in Bristol Cathedral, which goes back to Norman times. The building's there, very ancient. Uh, There was a point at which Bristol was virtually the capital of England. It's a big port city. And uh, Clifton, where the college was, was one of the wealthiest suburbs of Bristol. So that uh, the college was in a Jacobean home, very handsome, basic building, the base building. And then they had newer buildings added onto it to make up the college dwelling and so on. Uh, so I was. those were all tremendous privileges to go to residential colleges and get that kind of education. I counted it a real privilege. I had very famous theologians who were my teachers in those schools. Alec Mattia, and I've got books of his in my library here. Uh, J.I. Packer, who's world famous, very, very famous. Uh, he was a professor at one of the colleges that made up our education. Hello and welcome back to John Guest Remembers. This week marks the end of this first run of the miniseries where Pastor John recounts his formative years from early childhood to his earliest work in the ministry. In the next week or so, we will return to the regular format of the Our Church, Our Stories podcast as Ben and Sam return for season two. Be sure to look for those episodes on our website or wherever you get your podcasts. This week, Pastor John retells his earliest work in ministry after becoming ordained from seminary. Let me just mention a number of things that that are associated with the the college experience at uh, Clifton now Trinity. We did field work and I was recruited by a couple of the students, uh, Horace Busk and Morris Jones, to go and do Sunday school work at a parish called St. Werberg's. I still don't know who Werberg was, German spelling. Sounds like he must have been a German. I should look him up. Anyway, I spent uh, my Sunday afternoons with these little boys at St. Werberg's. Morris Jones was also associated with an area 
a very poor area of Bristol called Barton Hill. And the University of Bristol had a, what they called a settlement. They would go and do welfare work and buy land, do buildings, and do social work in that area and use the students and the wealth of the university to do some welfare. And there was such a settlement in Barton Hill, Bristol. And Morris Jones, who was another student, we were two years together, he recruited me to go down to Barton Hill. Now that's significant because I went down there, made friends with people who lived in the parish. We weren't so much associated with the church that was in that parish. We were not associated with that at all. We were associated with the university settlement that was there. In fact, I think that's what it was called, university settlement. And so we were working with the social workers on the property of the settlement and uh, did a lot of work with the kids. They were interested in the teenagers who were a wild bunch of urban kids, about as wild as it got in Bristol. In London and in Liverpool, where I got associated with similar works later, the, the kids were even wilder. The, you know, the areas rougher, more violent is. But they were fairly rough in uh, Barton Hill, Bristol. And I came from blue collar working in England because I saw myself, this is very, very interesting, being an evangelist to working neighborhoods in England, because that's what I came out of. So I saw myself as going into the ministry to go and work in blue collar England. And that's why I was very invested in Barton Hill, because that was the kind of people I could relate to. I was athletic, so I ended up playing for a Barton Hill soccer team. I coached a college soccer team. In fact, I have a photograph of me with the soccer team from Barton Hill of these rough kids. In fact, they were rough enough that one soccer match ended up in a fist fight on the field and was abandoned between my boys and the team we were playing. I'm smiling about it, but, <laughs> you know, that was out of control. But we had a bunch of tough kids and nobody was going to put anything on them. So when there were a couple of fouls on the field, our boys waited till the end of the game. And then they went up and they just set two. And it was pretty fierce. That was the soccer team I was coaching after I was ordained. Because what happened was when I graduated from Trinity, I went to work in that area, Barton Hill, for the church. And I already had all these connections with kids in the community. And then there was a whole new bunch of kids I met who were associated with the church. We took those kids camping, those rough kids, out of that area to North Wales, where we camped under canvas at a farm. And that was a, quite an experience with those kids, because uh, we were taking them out of the city and into beautiful North Wales, which is a beautiful area, camping. But my working with those kids um, was really something special because when I graduated and got ordained, I went to the rector of that parish and said, the vicar, Roy Henderson, his name was Alastair Roy Henderson, and he had a very cultured background, but had chosen to go into a working area as a vicar. He had worked with university students, in fact, with an organization called InterVarsity in England. And theologically, we were very, you know, very tight and had a similar training. He was ordained, I forget what college he went to, but uh, he knew of our college. And so when speaking with him, uh, I went to work with him as a curate. But I spent three years at that parish with St. Luke, with Christ Church. Barton Hill. And so now I take about two to three years, nearly three years of association with that area that translates into my going to live in that area as a minister being ordained, then hanging out with the kids of that area. So I was very accustomed to that area.